Well, it's wonderful to see all of you and uh, to not only just be talking to a screen, but to see some uh, f familiar faces, people that uh, we all love each other and uh, it's good to be together again online. And uh, welcome to anyone who's new. And we have been going through uh, some material concerning uh, the first the the meaning of the actual ceremony of baptism, some of the uh, things that we should understand about why they're why we practice baptism. <clears throat> and uh, we, we associated that with a covenant. And with also these important words of God, <clears throat> excuse me, words of God in Matthew 28, 19 through 20, <clears throat> uh, which we call the Great, <clears throat> Great Commission. The Gospel according to Matthew concludes with these words, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In the previous session, uh, last week, the purpose for this Trinitarian command was considered, namely that in the New Testament, God more fully reveals his Trinitarian nature. Discipleship, to be a disciple, is to know God particularly as a Trinity, to be disciples of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to be completely subject to the word that the Father gave to his Son, the Son gave to the Apostles, and the Apostles inscripturated it to pass the word on to all disciples of all generations. The Holy Spirit was given to help every generation learn through the same scriptures to learn the gospel and the knowledge of God and the will of God. This sense of discipleship, serving God as a trinity, was so important to the Lord that he revealed it in a commandment that must be kept by all true churches until the Lord returns. So you see, I think if you can understand these first comments, and if you joined us last week, if you haven't, I hope that you will review that material, watch that video. Uh, because you, you need to understand the covenantal connection between baptism and this, this uh, command to uh, make disciples of all nations and the Word of God and the Trinity. These four components are very important, and they are brought together in, in this commandment. <clears throat> it's a very important commandment. There are some religious groups that deny the Trinity, such as Jehovah's Witnesses, Unitarians, Jesus Only uh, from United Pentecostal Church, Oneness Pentecostals, Modalists, Muslims, and Black Hebrew Israelites claim that these verses in Matthew, or at least the Trinitarian uh, formula, was not part of Matthew's original gospel, but was a later addition to the text. I'm not going to do a study on any of those groups. That's all I want to say about them. Uh, this is not a seminar on other groups that claim to be Christian, uh, on, on whether we are right or they are wrong, or they are right or we are wrong. Um, my, my purpose in this seminar is to talk about this, this, these verses, particularly verse 19. Um, and you'll see why in a few moments. One of the ways anti-Trinitarians, also known as Unitarians, support this view that these words were not in the original gospel is by contending that the first version of Matthew was written in Hebrew, not in the Greek that has come down to us. They hope to discover an ancient manuscript of that foundational Hebrew gospel. Some claim they already have. Uh, comments by three early church authors inspire them with hope that it will eventually surface. Irenaeus uh, wrote, Matthew also issued a written gospel among the Hebrews in their own dialect, while Peter and Paul were preaching at Rome 
and laying the foundations of the church. Important comment. Um, Irin, men like Irenaeus and Origen and Papias, who we'll, we will see uh, in later, um, and many other apostolic church fathers are the ones that we, apostolic church fathers, and um, and then there are, there are the um, church fathers that were apologetic and uh, defended the faith in the second century. Uh, Irenaeus is in that time, Origen, uh, but the apostolic ones were the ones that followed the apostles that came just after his time. And their comments are all very important. They help us understand uh, some of the origins of the books of the New Testament. They give credibility to those books. Um, we know which books to trust in because of uh, these early followers of Christ and their leaders who wrote books, wrote a lot of books in the second century and third century. Um, so these are important comments. Matthew is supposed to have issued a written gospel among the Hebrews in their own dialect. We don't have it. No one has ever found it. Um, some people say that it does exist and it has been known uh, outside, of, outside of Palestine with a group of people in one part of the world. But um, if, if it, if it really was known to be the Hebrew text that, that underlies um, or is the foundation of Matthew's work, then all of the scholarship in the world would be paying attention to it. That's an important point to understand. Um, Origen, secondly, said this, as having learnt by tradition concerning the four Gospels, which alone are unquestionable in the church of God under heaven. That first was written according to Matthew, who was once a tax collector, but afterwards an apostle of Jesus Christ, who published it for those who from Judaism came to believe, composed as it was in the Hebrew language. So he is supposed to have first written in Hebrew. Okay, we can page down to uh, Papias' com comment. Uh, this is Eusebius writing about Papias. These things are related by Papias concerning Mark. But concerning Matthew, that, that means there are some things uh, just before this comment that concern the Gospel of Mark. But concerning Matthew, he, Papias, writes as follows. So then Matthew wrote the oracles in the Hebrew language. The oracles uh, is word, the words, logia, in the Hebrew language, and everyone interpreted them as he was able. Um, oracles was often used uh, by Greek-speaking authors to, to refer to the inspired text, um, divine inspiration. Let us pause here to consider an obvious question raised by these comments of these three early church fathers. Were all the Greek texts of Matthew derived from this one Hebrew text produced in 1380? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, we have not introduced the 1380 text yet. Uh, actually, uh, that belongs in another place, and uh, I missed it <laughs> when, I was, when I was writing and rewriting notes for this. So I'm going to give you a revised version of this. Uh, the patristic Greek scholars, patris, patristic means having to do with the fathers, um, the early fathers of the church, men like Eusebius and Papias and Origen, uh, were, 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 all, were, were, the, were all of the Greek texts of Matthew derived from this one Hebrew text um, that, that they are talking about. So these patristic Greek scholars the ones who translated Eusebius' church history from Greek to English are Dr. Arthur C. McGifford and Dr. Ernest C. Richardson. They published their critical comments on Eusebius' text. They consider the very same question in their comments that we are asking. The question of, does, does our Greek text, which all of our English texts come from, does it under, is it under 
girded, uh, is there a foundation of a Hebrew text behind it? They state that the Greek Gospel of Matthew, um, you could go back up, oh, the Greek Gospel of Matthew, yes, yeah, right there. The Greek Gospel of Matthew does not bear evidence of being produced as a translation from the Hebrew. Rather, there is evidence that the Greek Testament of Matthew was already in use at the time Papias made the comment above. In other words, the comment that we read by Papias, when that comment was made, uh, the Greek Testament was already being used, and Papias had it. He already had the Greek Testament. He was using it. And so they, they state this, um, Dr. Arthur C. McGifford and Dr. Ernest C. Richardson. They state, uh, quote, on the tradition that Matthew wrote a Hebrew, Hebrew gospel, our Greek gospel of Matthew was certainly in existence at the time Papias wrote, for it's quoted in the epistle of Barnabas, which was written not later than the first quarter of the second century, the time of Papias. There is therefore no reason for assuming that the gospel of Matthew, which Papias was acquainted with, was a different gospel than our own. This, however, does not prove that the logia, Remember the word from, um, from the, the quotation by Papias. The Greek word behind uh, the oracles is logia. Okay, Papias actually used the word logia, not oracles. Uh, so that the logia which Matthew wrote, supposing Papias' report to be correct about um, Matthew writing first in Hebrew, that the Legia uh, that Matthew wrote were identical with or even of the same nature as our Gospel of Matthew. It's, it's urged by many that the word Logia could be used only to describe a collection of the words or discourses of the Lord. Hence, it's assumed that Matthew wrote a work of this kind, which of course is quite a different thing from our first Gospel. Our first Gospel is not just a list of all of the sayings of the Lord, which people think that that's, that that's the uh, structure of Matthew's first gospel. Um, just a collection of sayings. It's assumed because we don't have it. Um, Lightfoot has shown, Lightfoot has shown, uh, Lightfoot was a scholar that uh, wrote a lot about the early church fathers and uh, wrote a commentary um, related to the church fathers and related to the um, Greek um, based on the New Testament. So uh, a, a great scholar in his time. The light, Lightfoot has shown that the word logia, oracles, is not necessarily confined to a collection of discourses merely, but that it may be used to describe a work containing also a narrative of, of events. The New Testament contains a narrative of events. So what he's saying is Logia can refer to that, not just a collection. This being the case, it cannot be said that Matthew's Logia must necessarily have been something different from our present gospel. Notice those words. These are the scholars that um, worked with the Apostolic Fathers texts they are, they are uh, experts in Greek, and they make clear that it cannot be said that Matthew's Logia must necessarily have been something different from our present gospel. Still, our Greek Matthew is certainly not a translation of a Hebrew original. How can they tell this? By linguistic uh, features of a text. For, for example, if we translate something from Telugu or from Hindi into English, it's going to look different from something that's translated from, let's say, um, Spanish into English. There will be different characteristics of, of that translation. And so that's why these authors say that our Greek Matthew is certainly not a translation of a Hebrew original. It was written originally in Greek, they say, not, not based on a Hebrew and then translated. 
Hence, there may be a long step between Matthew's Hebrew logia and our Greek gospel. But if our Greek Matthew was known to Papias, and if it's not a translation of a Hebrew original, then one of two alternatives follows. Either he could not accept the Greek Matthew, which was in current use, that's our canonical Matthew, the, the version we have is canonized by the early church fathers. That means it's the accepted text, accepted by the early church as divinely inspired. Either uh, he could not accept this canonical Greek text that he himself was using, or else he was not acquainted with the Hebrew Matthew. Of the former alternative, we have no hint in the fragments preserved to us uh, that he could not accept the Greek Matthew. From the way in which Papias, Papias speaks of these Hebrew logia seems highly probable. I mean, the latter, while the latter, um, that he was not acquainted with the Hebrew Matthew seems highly probable. It may therefore be said to be probable that Papias, the first one that mentions a Hebrew Matthew, speaks not from personal knowledge, but upon the authority of tradition only. Now, you can see that in this uh, seminar this week, I'm using a lot of quotations because I, I want to show you the scholarly work that um, shows that the text that we have uh, is first based on a, a Greek original only, and that the um, Hebrew, Hebrew uh, text of Matthew that we're going to look at a little, at least we're going to talk about it, um, is not the foundation for our Greek text. So there are a number of scholars that worked on this about um, 20 or 35 years ago. And, uh, and now it has come up again after it was silenced uh, 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 in an earlier generation. Uh, people have forgotten the good work of these scholars and now they are promoting again this Hebrew text, which we're going to talk about. Many Unitarians argue that there is evidence of a Hebrew version of Matthew which does not include verse 19, nor the names of the Trinity. Dr. Ruckart of the Apostolic Theological Bible, Bible College writes the following to support the ancient reliability of this mysterious manuscript, known as the Shem Tov Hebrew Matthew text. He says, it was known by the Catholic Church that the Jews had preserved a copy of the original Gospel of Matthew in the Hebrew language. Now, he doesn't give any kind of uh, critical notes about this, this proof that it was known by them. There's no evidence that he gives. There's no citations. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a um, documented comment. So how, how, how this was preserved and handed down to us, we do not know. How this text was handed down, it appears in uh, the 13th century. And how it was handed down, he says, we do not know. In fact, it does not matter. It exists. And that is proof enough that God wanted it preserved. Okay, now let's take that line of thinking. He's going to show us a Hebrew text which does not contain Matthew 28, verse 19, okay? And he says he doesn't know how it came down to the 13th century. It doesn't matter. It exists. Okay, so what about 5,900 approximately manuscripts that we have today, almost 6,000 ancient Greek manuscripts that support the New Testament, many of them have uh, are, are texts of Matthew, and if they exist, is it proof that God wanted them to preserve? Um, it, it, is it credible for us to say that there's no, no need for us to do any research on the origin of those texts because they exist? This is very lame thinking. I'll continue with the quotation. 
There have been many attempts to destroy the credibility of this very valuable Hebrew gospel for obvious reasons. It is the only existing manuscript that proves, proves, Matthew 28, 19 did not originally contain the Trinitarian baptismal formula. Well, we're going to look at some of that proof about the text. Um, actually, we'll look at the refutation of it more than the proof. Ruckhart goes on to insist that the Trinitarian baptismal formula that we have in verse 19 was fabricated at Nicaea in 325 AD. Okay, we're going to consider why, the, why, why some people say this. Okay, why, why it is that they attack the New Testament that existed before Nicaea, before 325 AD? We'll consider that question later. The Shem Tov Hebrew Matthew text is especially important to Unitarians because it does demonstrate a non-Trinitarian reading of the Great Commission. This is a copy of the last page. You can page up so we can see all of it. Okay, the Hebrew is on the left. On the right, we have these three verses, 18, 19, and 20. Jesus drew near to them and said to them, To me has been given all power in heaven and earth. Go, only one word in verse 19. That seems strange, doesn't it? Go and teach them to carry out all the things which I have commanded you forever. Just the fact that there's only one word in verse 19, uh, that raises doubts immediately about whether, whether the entire verse of the original text is there or they have left some words out. Why did they have to keep... Okay, let's page down a little. Go and teach them to carry out all the things which I have oh, me too, forever. And then also the words, I will be with you always till the end of the age are not there. Now you can imagine if a Unitarian uh, in the 13th century wrote this text, he would not want to say that, you know, Jesus is God who could be with us always uh, to the end of the age. Uh, he, it depends on what his view of Christ is. You know, some of the uh, uh, Trinitarian uh, controversies that existed in the early church. Uh, can you page up the text just a little? Okay. Um, no, not, I, I didn't mean down, but bring it, yeah, the other way. You can bring the, you can page down just a little. Okay, okay, so look at how the text looks with the verse numbers on the full text together at the bottom of the page. Go, verse 19, 20, and teach them. Okay, it seems obvious that there are words that have been cut out and they are trying to hold to a verse numbering. Um, while leaving out many words. But let, let's page down now. <clears throat> if these words truly are from the original text of Matthew's gospel, they will disturb many. The Hebrew gospel uh, that we're, we just looked at was composed in Spain, most likely Aragon, in 1380. Uh, I'm sorry, 14th century, I said 13th. The Jewish author Shem Tob ben Isaac ben Shaprut included it as the 12th or 13th book in a polemical treatise directed against Christians known as Evan Bohan, or in English, the touchstone. It was actually written to, uh, to try to stop Jews from converting to Christianity. Uh, most of the touchstone was written for that. And then this was included as a, um, a, a copy of the New Testament to be used along with that work. It was published later by George Howard, a professor in the Department of Religion in the University of Georgia in 1987 under the title, 
the Gospel of Matthew according to a primitive Hebrew text. Howard contended that it was based on the original Hebrew text first composed by the disciple Matthew, and that the Greek texts were based on this earlier Hebrew. Any variation from the Hebrew Matthew text discovered in our Greek text must then be a corruption introduced by later editors. Is Shem Tov based on an early Hebrew version? Let's consider the trustworthiness of the Shem Tov text and the assertion that it was based on a very early Hebrew text of Matthew. The same year that this text was published in the U.S., in 1989, W.L. Peterson, uh, a scholar of languages, wrote a critical review of the Shem Tob Hebrew Matthew for the Society of Biblical Literature, uh, which is a scholar, scholarly journal. Um, Petri Luomanen, who wrote Jew, Recovery, Recovering Jewish Christian Sex and Gospels, in 2012, mentions that W.L. Peterson argued convincingly for a later date of Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew manuscript. A later date means it was not written at an early time, the time of Matthew, but it was written more like in the time that the author Shem Tov actually wrote in the 14th century. So Peterson argued for a later date of that manuscript, showing that it was connected to diatessaronic readings, that's Tatian's diatessaron, which was written in the second century, and some old Latin translations. In his article, Peter Peterson analyzed and refuted a number of arguments used by Howard to contend for an early date, and he demonstrated extensive textual evidence, which indicates Shem Tov's Matthew is dependent upon sources such <clears throat> such as the Vorlage of the Liege manuscript, <clears throat> which was in Dutch, and the Vetus Syra and the Vetus Latina. These were manuscripts that were um, actually produced around, around the, uh, they were produced as late manuscripts and available to Shem Tov. In 1995, however, a new edition of the Shem Tov Gospel um, I say, however, because Peterson basically answered, um, answered the arguments for an early date so well that um, when this later edition of the Shem Tov Gospel was published again, um, the, author, uh, the author did not even, George Howard, did not even include any of those earlier arguments that he was using. So that tells you that um, those arguments prove to be untrustworthy, untenable, faulty, uh, based on the exten extensive arguments of Peterson. Okay, so he, he produced it again without those arguments. Just he only tried to base it on an early text using three more simple arguments, more almost logical arguments, rather than uh, his extensive arguments that were, that were um, refuted uh, soundly. So this was soon followed by another review by Peterson, in which he argues that the work was not based on any primitive Hebrew text, but was a production of the medieval period in which Shem Tob lived, firmly stating that Howard's evidence and theories concerning the origin and transmission of this Hebrew Matthew must be dismissed completely. Okay, here is um, a, a um, commendable scholar, a well-known scholar, uh, stating that uh, this work is, all of the arguments for an early text are simply not tenable, not, not uh, provable, not trustworthy. Peterson then describes in painstaking detail the pertinent literature, both medieval and modern, uh, which, were, which, uh, which shows that this text was not an early text. And then he provided numerous additional unique and non-unique parallels between Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew and, if you can page down, and the Liege, um, 
Oh, you went too, that's too far down. Oh, that's right. That's, I'm sorry. That's good. The middle of Dutch leads harmony. And he pointed out the factual, logical, and philological errors which have caused previous attempts to stipulate the genesis of this Hebrew Matthew to collapse. Okay, so Genesis is the beginning of using this as a Hebrew Matthew. That's what Genesis means. So he, he uh, gave, he, he provided, all, he showed all of the errors on facts, on logic, and on textual evidence. Those are philological errors, which caused all of those attempts to base it as, to, to begin Genesis, to begin to use it as an early Hebrew Matthew to simply collapse because there was no uh, foundation for that at all. Luo Manin, um, who a scholar I mentioned earlier, discovered more literary dependency in, dependency in Shem Tob, writing another possible so source for Shem Tob's diateristic readings is a Catalan version of Matthew. Um, and he says, Shenke published the Coptic text of Matthew and he tries to show the primitive character of this version, suggesting that both the Coptic Matthew and the canonical Matthew must depend on an earlier Hebrew version of Matthew, which is also behind the Jewish Christian Gospels. But this scholar says Shanki clearly overestimates the value of the Coptic version as testifying to an earlier version of the Gospel of Matthew. Now, Luano, Luo Manin and others have only, uh, I mean, the, the work is going on. This is a later um, publication in 2012. And uh, maybe by now, um, they have had a time to more fully evaluate the Coptic Matthew and uh, to uh, refute its, uh, also refute its early uh, production, its early origin. Okay, the earliest papyrus manuscripts of Matthew end with chapter 26. Now, this is important. Let me explain what this statement means. This is my own comment. Uh, we have papyrus manuscripts, which are the first things that were used by the early church to write the gospel, to write the New Testament. Papyrus is very fragile. It's made from a plant that grows along the River Nile and along the banks of the, the um, Mediterranean Sea. And they lay these stems down flat, and then they lay other stems flat the other way, press a, press a heavy stone on them, and let that sit until it's completely dry. And then when they remove it, cut it into the shape of a paper. That's papyrus. You can imagine that that would not last very long as a paper. Uh, it has to be preserved very carefully. And in the climates that we have in many places, rainy climates and winters and other kinds of things, um, and uh, the mold and mildew that comes from a rainy climate, most of that decomposes quite rapidly. So that's why we have a smaller collection of papyrus manuscripts. That's one of the reasons. There's another reason. Uh, but it's also why many manuscripts lack pages at the beginning or end, ending or along the edges of the manuscript where it would uh, wear out the, the, the quickest. The oldest New Testament manuscripts, which do contain Matthew 28, 19, are all unseals. Unseals. They are Aleph, written around. Uh, C means around, about. Uh, 350 AD, Codex Alex Alexandrinus, uh, written around 400, and we say circa 400, and, and Codex B, Codex Vaticanus, written circa 300 to 350, somewhere in that time. These demonstrate complete agreement with the reading, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing or having baptized them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now notice, these texts are after the time of the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. After 325 AD, all texts have this 
the last two chapters of Matthew, and they have th this verse, okay? Um, Unseals are written on leather, not, not on uh, papyrus. Uh, this leather is known as vellum. It's sometimes called vellum or parchment by uh, commentators or scholars. Um, and they use that instead of papyrus because the manuscript could endure for many generations longer than papyrus. Vellum, um, vellum manuscripts can last so long that uh, we have a number of texts in which early, the early church scraped off the original text because it was becoming weak and they wanted to reuse the vellum and then they put another text over that original text. And what we, we have the technology today to, <clears throat> to go to look at that original text, to photograph it, and to draw, draw it out of the vellum and to actually read it. So a lot of the texts that we are adding to the texts that have already been found, the ancient Greek texts, are these palimpsets, these um, um, copies that are underneath an original copy. They, they, they underlie an original copy. They've been erased, but we can, still, we can still draw them out with the technology that is available to the scholars that work in this field today. So they keep finding new texts this way by looking, at a, by looking very carefully at a, an old vellum text and trying to see and using instruments to determine if there's an old text that was erased from it. Okay, um, now if we can page up to the last uh, illustration, the square, uh, there is a copy of the, copy of a website showing a manuscript in a picture that should be right here, but it slid into a different place just before I made this PDF. So this is it right here. Okay, um, this is the Alex, 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 Alex Andrinus text, okay? And they have a website. You can go to their website and you can search out what is in that text. And you can see the text is on the left. Uh, the, the, it was written in Unseals, capital letters. And the, and the, uh, the Greek that we use in most texts today is on the right above. And the English translation is in the lower right. So it's very convenient. Anyone can do, anyone can do searching in the Alexandrinus text by going to the website and using this wonderful tool that they've given to us. So it, it says in verse 19 in this text, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then you have uh, the rest of the text, teaching them to observe all things, whatever I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, all the days to the conclusion of the age, or to the very end of the age that we have in our uh, English translation today. Okay, let's page down. Um, so you can see that we have this at the end of our manuscripts after the Council of Nicaea. Um, we don't have a surviving second century papyrus manuscript of verse 19. Okay, so that could present a problem for us. We'll consider whether it really does. Every manuscript which preserves Matthew 28 from AD 350 and after does contain these words of the important commandment of the Lord Jesus, to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Every manuscript of the New Testament from after 350 AD. Negative critics who attack the Trinity or references to Christ's deity in the New Testament usually focus their attention on the Council of Nicaea, where several presbyters, that, that, that's a word from our Greek New Testament, which we translate elders, it means pastor elders, Several presbyters con contended that Jesus had a beginning and was created as the first of God's works. Uh, it was particularly Arius from Alexandria, a pastor from Alexandria, Alexandria who wanted to contend. That, well, actually, his, his bishop 
um, his bishop in Alexandria um, was was bringing this matter to the first Christian consul after the great persecution of Diocletian. Diocletian was going to destroy the church everywhere in the world. Okay, so as soon as he died and Constantine uh, fought a battle with another general to become the emperor, um, when he won the battle, uh, they had the Council of Nicaea, which Constantine, uh, the first Christian em emperor, I say Christian with, you know, uh, understanding that he was becoming Christian. Um, the first Christian em emperor presided over this council, and uh, and he, Arius, contended at the council that Jesus had a beginning and was created as the first of God's works, as a second God, who was adopted by God to be His Son, and who also created the universe at the Father's command. So that, you know, the text says all things were made by him, yes, but first God made him. Uh, so that is the view of Arianism. That's the view of the Jehovah's Witnesses and some of the other uh, anti-Trinitarians. Not all. Almost all of the representatives of all the churches who attended the council disagreed with Arius' view and condemned it. Dan Brown, author of the Da Vinci Code, remember Dan Brown? And he's produced a number of other books since that time, and so have his friends, uh, his associates. Uh, he argued in, in his book, The Da Vinci Code, that Constantine made Christ to be God at the Council of Nicaea. Then he ordered all texts. Constantine ordered all texts of the New Testament destroyed and a new text written, which reveals Christ as God. It wasn't hard for Brown to convince his readers. After all, there are relatively few manuscripts surviving from before the time of the Council of Nicaea, and a great many well-preserved manuscripts after that time. This is also the reason that Ruckart, the man who was presenting this uh, Hebrew Matthew uh, that we looked at above, he was presenting it on a website. By the, by the way, Ruckart, um, if you would like to get a degree, a PhD, he will sell you one for $595. If you agree that God is one, he's not a, a trinity, he's a, he's a single person. If you agree and you stand up against others, he'll give you a PhD for that. You just have to pay, uh, I think for that PhD, it costs about $1,200. Okay, so Ruckart and other Unitarians like him insist that the Trinitarian baptismal formula was fabricated at Nicaea in 325 AD. Okay, so that is, that's an easy claim to make because of the, the overwhelming number of manuscripts after the Council of Nicaea and the relatively, I say relatively because there are a lot of manuscripts of the New Testament, they just lack this, the, the Matthew manuscripts lack this particular um, verse section. Actually, they, they lack the last two chapters. Um, and that, that's not surprising from a papyrus manuscript, uh, because that would be the, if it was rolled up, that would be the part most fragile that would break off and crumble most easily because it would be rolled more tightly. Okay, and then when they unroll it, as it's getting fragile, pieces would break off. Okay, did Constantine invent Christ's deity? Did Constantine invent Christ's deity, as Dan Brown argued? Thankfully, there are many passages of the New Testament which, which prove that Christ himself said he was God, or that the apostle wrote that he is God, the apostles, all of them and the men who worked with the apostles who wrote books of the New Testament. These passages exist in many papyrus manuscripts of the New Testament from early 2nd century, about A.D. 125-50. to 50. Quotations of such passages are also found in many writings of the early church fathers throughout the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th century when they quote the New Testament, where it says that Jesus is God, many times. Uh, you are all um, familiar with the New Testament, very, very well familiar. You know that many times the New Testament says Jesus is God. 
okay? So here's an example of one text from the first chapter of John's Gospel. I pulled this out of my apologetic notes, so if any of my apologetic students from the past are here, uh, they would have seen this already. Um, here's an example from the first chapter of John's Gospel in which John clearly states that Christ is God with the Father. Okay, you can page down to that translation. Um, what I did was take manuscripts that were available, available to me in electronic format, um, and I lined them up with each other. Okay, and I'm going to explain some things about these manuscripts. Um, so the first one is Papyrus 66. If you look in the upper left corner, this is called Papyrus 66. Believed to have been, this copy believed to have been made around 150 AD, and it says, um, in the beginning was the word, Logos, and the Logos, with the word, what was with God, and the word was God. Now, if any of you are Greek uh, students, you can see from this text that the text seems to say, and God was the word, okay? And so the Jehovah's Witnesses took this, uh, it's, the, it's the last words of the first, sen first sentence, the first verse, and, it's, and where, it's, where you see the circle with a line through it. Let me, let me do this on the blackboard so that you can, um, you can follow what I'm saying here, okay? It says, um, I better move the camera a little better. Okay, um, good. Okay, so it says, um, okay, you took away my text. <laughs> I want to make sure that I, I transcribe it exactly uh, according, it, it's like this. Um, to us, hain, ha, Log, let me do it more neatly. Lagos, okay. This this is the word for God, face. And if you notice in this one, in this line, there's only two letters there, because the whenever the a, a person who was Hebrew, if he made a copy of the Greek New Testament. Wherever the word God would appear, or wherever Jesus would appear, he would, he would leave out the middle letters, and he would put only the first letter and the last letter, okay, with, with the name Jesus. The first letter in Greek is uh, Iota. The last letter is Sigma. I put the English letters here just to illustrate it so you understand what I'm doing. Okay, so if you look at these, I, I've lined up eight texts here. If you start at the top and go down, you'll see that the first four versions have Theta Sigma, Theta Sigma. This is a clue that these versions were made at a time when they were, they were made by uh, Jews that were copying the New Testament, or they were made by Christians that were sensitive to Jews that were using the New Testament. Because the Jews, um, they started this with the Old Testament that wherever the, the uh, Tetragrammaton, um, the Tetragrammaton is these four letters in the Old Testament, wherever the Tetragrammaton, Yahweh, occurs, or Jehovah, they would put the vowel points for, for the um, word Lord. They would put the vowel points for the word Lord there. And so that when they're reading uh, the, the, the holy name, the covenant name, uh, they would not actually say it. They would say the word Lord. Looking at the vowel points, they would remember, oh, we can't say it. Because anyone who takes the name of Yahweh, our God, in vain, um, God, will, God will remember that. And... Uh, and so they were so afraid that they were committing some sin in their life, and everybody does, and they thought that made them impure. 
uh, like Isaiah walking into the temple, and he's saying, my lips are full of sin, and, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. You know, and so um, they, they didn't want to say the divine name. They put the vowel points for, for the word Lord. Um, and and what, the way that the Jews did this with the earliest manuscripts of the New Testament when they were handled by Jews was to uh, do this with the, word, the name uh, God, which is theta, sigma for them. Uh, if you look farther down the text, it's theta, epsilon, omicron, sigma, which is like saying uh, T-H-E-O-S. T-H is the theta, the first, le first letter that looks like a circle with a line through it. Okay, so this is a clue that these earliest manuscripts were handled by Jews that believed that Jesus is God. Wherever they, they put the name Jesus, and they, they leave out the middle letters, they, they considered him God. They wouldn't dare to uh, write the name in full. They, they wanted to remind themselves that this is a holy name. It must be read with the utmost reverence. Okay, so that's what's happening in the text. Now, one, one thing I wanted to explain about this is that in Greek, um, there was a rule that when, when the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses made their first version of the New Testament. They didn't understand this rule. There was a rule in Greek at the time, and they've, they've made their own grammar now, so they've made rules that fit their errors. But at the time, and there's, there's a long-standing rule that um, with, with Greek, the, the location of the words in the sentence do not determine the meaning sometimes, uh, usually. Um, you put at the beginning of the sentence the word that you want most to emphasize, okay? So this word, this, this is the, the, like the word the, okay, it's the article. And this is the word that tells you that in a, in a, um, a, a sentence that has the verb to be, uh, like I am, I am Yahweh, um, or God was, the word, is what it looks like. In a sentence that has the word was, both sides are kind of equal. Was is like, was is like an, is is like an equal sign. So when you have the, the definite article in front of one of the nouns, it means that's the subject of the sentence. Um, it's a common rule in Greek that uh, they should have known if they actually understood Greek well. So th that means that this is emphasized. And what it's actually saying is um, God. The, the word was God. It's, it's like the author wants to say this very strongly, that not only was the word with God, but the word was God. And so he has to do the construction like this. That's the way to emphasize the word God in, a, in, a, in an equal sentence with um, the verb to be. Okay, we can go back to looking at the text now. And uh, so you can see the first four, um, the, up to the sixth century, they were very sensitive about offending Jews, or these were texts that were actually produced by Jews. The left side shows that the Beza text was uh, produced in the sixth century. And then we have these later century texts from the time of the Reformation, um, and, then, um, and then 18th century, uh, Textus Receptus, 1881. And then we have the uh, texts that we have today, Nestle Allen. Now we're looking at the 28th version. I, I was working with the 26th version. It, there's not really any difference, uh, any um, important difference today. Um, then S SBL GNT, which, which is the Society of B Biblical Literature, Greek New Testament, and then um, another one, the AGNT. Um, and so these, these are three schools, or three uh, groups of scholars that have been working on studying manuscripts and producing a manuscript that is as close as possible 
to the original text, considering all variations between manuscripts. And they have to look at like 6,000 and more. If they look at the ones that are translations and work backwards from those, then they've got like 24, 25,000 texts. That's a lot of scholarly work. It's not all done. They're still doing it. They're working through a huge amount of uh, papyrus documents that have not even been translated and cataloged yet. So there's going to be more appearing in the future. Uh, but uh, that's where we are now, uh, nearly 6,000 uh, papyrus manuscripts, um, uh, having parts or uh, complete sections of the scripture. Well, this early text that was handled by the Jews says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. This one, the first word um, in the second sentence is hutas. It does not mean him, he. It means this one. It means a male, this one. This one was in the beginning with God. He, he himself was God. Strongly say it. And this one was in the beginning with God. He was not the father. Okay, so he was with him. This is a very important text here that's, that describes Christ's deity. Okay, let's go down to the, the second uh, uh, set of manuscripts. Okay, I hope that all of you who are not uh, Greek readers can follow what I'm trying to show you here. Um, but here's, here is from verse 10 and 11. He was in the world, that is the Logos, he was in the world, and the world was created through him, and the world did not know him. He is God. He, he was with God. He is God. And he came into the world, and the world did not know him. God, he, came onto his own things, and his own people did not receive him. Okay. Um, so you can see, just going down each column, the words are the same. They are the, they are the same. They are the same text. Okay, there's no major change. If you look at the last manuscript uh, in the right, lower right side, there's a letter missing, and so the word is in blue. That letter is called movable new, uh, and uh, that appears sometimes, and it doesn't, depending on the, the, what, what is following in the uh, following, uh, uh, well, no, that, that one um, doesn't really change the meaning of the text at all. That's what I'm trying to say, okay? So let's go down to um, the, the commentary again. These verses are only a few examples of the earliest New Testament Greek manuscripts which describe Christ's deity. There are dozens more that could be cited from very early manuscript evidence, not only from the Gospels, but from all 27 books of the New Testament. There is abundant proof that Constantine did not exalt his favored religious leader, Jesus, to be God Almighty. Jesus was God from the very beginning, from the, from the, from the, the first writing of the New Testament. So why were there so few manuscripts preserved before the time? of Constantine. Dan Brown said Constantine had them all destroyed. Actually, Eusebius, the great historian of the early church, was a contemporary of Constantine. He writes of the persecution that Diocletian's cruel edicts in March 303 sent against the Christians, commanding that the churches be leveled to the ground and the scriptures be destroyed by fire and ordering that those who held places of honor be degraded, and that the household servants, if they persisted in the profession of Christianity, be deprived of freedom. This was the beginning of one of the most horrible periods of persecution in history. Eusebius describes the, dis the destruct destruction, excuse me, the, dis the destruction of sacred books, he says, we saw with our own eyes the houses of prayer thrown down to the ground, <clears throat> down to the very foundations, and the divine and sacred scriptures committed to the flames in the midst of the marketplaces. 
Con, um, Diocletian was ruler of the Roman Empire. Everywhere that uh, there were churches, he commanded them destroyed, Christians to be arrested, and the scriptures that they kept there to be burned. Now, papyri pap papyrus and vellum were both um, very expensive paper. You know, you had to kill a couple animals to, to make uh, a few sheets of vellum, so to make it very much vellum. And uh, they also use vellum, they, they use the leather for shoes and belts and many other things. So, so um, you know, the papyrus also uh, was, was a costly substance uh, in that time. So mostly the churches had the copies of the manuscripts and the, the, the scholars and the pastors. And people would come to the church to, to hear the scriptures read or to read it themselves. You had to pay a lot of money to have your own copies of the scrolls uh, in those times. But we don't have time to go into that, uh, to, that uh, data so I can show you what I mean. Well, this, this destruction ended when Constantine became emperor. This leaves us with a problem yet unanswered. How can we establish that the scriptures describe God as a trinity, especially in the Great Commission of Matthew 28, 18 through 20? Luke Wayne, an author of Christian Apologetics and Research Ministry, an online ministry that's known as CARM, CARM, Many of you have accessed CARM's apologetic resources before. Um, Luke Wayne writes for them, and he points out every ancient manuscript where the final pages of Matthew have survived contains the account of Jesus giving the Great Commission and includes the command to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is not only true of the Greek manuscripts, but also of the translations of Matthew into other ancient languages. So the manuscript evidence is 100% unanimously in agreement on the ending of Matthew and on the Trinitarian formula. Any theory that wishes to assert that these words are not part of the original has to go outside of and against the actual physical evidence. But there's more evidence. There's evidence from before the time of Constantine. Wayne lifts evidence, evidence from the following early Christian authors. The Didache, one of the earliest Christian documents outside the New Testament, believed to have been written before the close of the, new, of the first century. And it says, having first said all these things, um, it tells you what you should say in baptism, and then baptize into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit in flowing water. Okay, uh, it also says uh, in the next verse that if flowing water is not present, then pour water uh, in the three names, pour water over the head in the three names. Justin Martyr, who died in 165 AD, affirms that baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was the practice of the early, earliest churches. Was the practice of the earliest churches. Justin Martyr affirms this. Okay, um, Tatian, a disciple of Justin, produced a, a harmony of the four Gospels called the Diatessaron. It contains the Trinitarian formula. Then said, uh, the, the, when, I, when we say harmony of the four Gospels, that's putting all the four Gospels together into one story. And that, so it was done early. It's called the Diatessaron. You can read it. It's translated into English. You might want to look at it. It contains the Trinitarian formula. Then said Jesus unto them, I have given all authority in heaven and earth, and as my Father hath sent me, so I also send you. Go now into all the world and preach my gospel and all the creation and teach all the peoples and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to keep all whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the days unto the end of the world. So there is a combination of the... Jesus' final words in the four Gospels, some of his final words. Irenaeus of Lyons states that these are the words of Jesus. Go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, before you page down, 
Justin Martyr died in 165 AD. Okay, so he wrote uh, that he wrote that the practice of the earliest churches was to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit before 165 AD. Okay, the Didache said we baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit before the end of the first century. That was a common document used by many churches, the Didache, not inspired, but it was called the Teaching of the Apostles. That's uh, Didache means to teach. So it's called the teaching. Uh, Tatian, uh, Didache is a Greek word. Um, Tatian, a disciple of Justin, um, so he's writing around Justin's time. Maybe he wrote before or after Justin was killed. Uh, he produced a harmony of the four Gospels. And then Irenaeus is around 170, 180 AD. And so you see that it's consistent throughout the first century that they were baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Where did they get those words from? Did they just produce them? Did they come up with this idea? They, were, they all believed that we, could, we had to follow the Scripture, that we had to learn this only from the Scripture. Okay, we can page down. That means that the scripture that they were using at the time, the Greek Testament that they had, had the last two chapters of Matthew. Because this, this is at the end of Matthew, okay? This is at the end of those last two chapters. So all of those church fathers had a complete New Testament uh, 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 copy of the Gospel of Matthew on papyrus available to them. They had it. Okay, it's not, it was not lacking from the earliest uh, New Testament manuscripts. It just wore, wore out from the ones that were passed down to us. Origen expounded on Matthew 28, 18 through 20 in his commentary on Matthew. It's, that's around 190 to 210 uh, that he would have written his words. He expounded on this verse, okay, these verses long before the Council of Nicaea, you know, uh, like a hundred years before, uh, yeah, a hundred years before, 200 AD, Council of Nicaea is 325. Tertullian, writing in Latin, around 210, we could say 210 AD, mentions the Trinitarian formula twice. Accordingly, after one of these, the 12 apostles had been struck off, he commanded the 11 others, on his departure to the Father to go and teach all nations who were to be baptized into the Father and into the Son and into the Holy Ghost. Um, he wrote that in a prescription against heretics. That's a book he wrote that's available now. And then again he wrote, For the law of baptizing has been imposed and the formula prescribed. Go, he saith, teach the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Eusebius at 300 AD, uh, before 350, before the Council of Nicaea, he was writing his church history. Um, well, we don't know how much um, how much he was able to write. How he wrote some of it after the Council of Nicaea, obviously, or uh, after the fall of uh, Diocletian around three, was it 311? Uh, three, no, three, around 310. And uh, the first edicts to set free the Christians and to stop the persecution were issued in 311 and 313 by Constantine. Uh, so he says, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the maker of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God, God from God, light from light, life from life, Son only begotten, firstborn of every creature before all the ages, begotten from the Father, by whom also all things were made, who for our salvation was made flesh and lived among men and suffered and rose again the third day and ascended to the Father and will come again in glory to judge quick and dead. And we believe also in one Holy Ghost, believing each of these to be and to exist, the Father truly Father, the Son truly Son, and the Holy Ghost truly Holy Ghost, as also our Lord, sending forth his disciples for the preaching, said, Go teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Now, Eusebius argued with Arius. He was on the side of Arius 
at the Council of Nicaea. He himself was an Arian. But what he's written here seems to be his way of saying that um, it's like he, he wants to agree with the people that are arguing against Arius. You know, this is his letter to the church in Caesarea. It was not written to the Council of Nicaea, but uh, it is based on things like this. People have argued that uh, Eusebius was less Arian than Arius was, even though he made some very strong Arius comments uh, early on. And uh, maybe later he um, became less Arian. All references to the Trinitarian formula above are drawn from Wayne's cited article. You can look in the footnotes of, this, um, of these notes, and you can look at these articles yourself. You can look at all of the materials I used. I, uh, most of it, uh, some I access from my own uh, Bible, Bible programs, but uh, another article by Luke Wayne cites many other early mentions of the Trinity in the Bible and in early Christian literature. I thought I should throw that one in uh, so that you can argue for the Trinity uh, using a, a nicely written document by Luke Wayne. Uh, that it's, it's in the footnote, verse, uh, footnote 23. There are many other ancient manuscripts which contain the text of Matthew 28 and uh, 18 through 20, or quote the words of the text um, of, of, of the text of the Gospel of Matthew, some of the texts of the Gospel of Matthew. Some of the most important are manuscript B, Psi, D, Meg, Sa, Bob, Bob, Cyrus. So here's a list of manuscripts that might be helpful to you, maybe not. Uh, for scholars, they might want to use them. Um, these are texts which are not really uncertain about the Trinitarian formula, but they have a variant on whether you use the word whether the text ends with the word amen or it doesn't end with the word amen. That doesn't really change the meaning of the text at all. Uh, there are more than sufficient reasons to be confident that the words of Matthew 28, 18 through 20 existed in the earliest manuscripts of Matthew's gospel. We did not cover all of the early church father quotations that could be available for us to quote, for us to use. Okay, so. Um, there is more evidence than this. And so um, you can look at that, uh, um, that Hebrew Matthew without fear and, uh, and, and hold your position in great confidence that God wants us to be disciples of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, any questions? Uh, brother, what was... Uh, uh, who I have was, to turn up uh, my volume, just a moment. I'm not hearing you very well. Uh, let me yeah. put another speaker on. Uh, who was uh, Rekart? Okay, who was what? Uh, record R E C K A R T. Can you say it one more time? Uh, who was this uh, author or this person? Record R E C K A R T. Record. Yeah, yeah, he is the he is the founder or principal of a seminary that teaches Unitarianism, and he has a website where he's posted this one page. Okay, that shows okay. that 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 shows that the um, the earliest, uh, supposedly, that's what he's believing, that the earliest um, copy of the New Testament did not contain Matthew 28, 19. And uh, he's commanding all, uh, all Trinitarians to repent of their heresy and to join him. So repent of your heresy quickly, now that you know the truth. Okay? So... That's his website. He doesn't provide any kind of documentary evidence. He says that uh, efforts have been made to disprove this manuscript, and he doesn't seem to 
um, take a scholarly approach, but in in um, in looking for this manuscript, I came across his website, and uh, I thought it would be interesting to uh, just uh, start from there, you know, and so this is what the kind of things people are putting out there, um, and they are, they are, uh, you know, trying to catch people to follow, to join their position, and to join their church, um, and this man will even, his his seminary will give you a PhD if you're if you will hold to a oneness position. So you don't even have to be a scholar. You don't have to study. The fact that you have learned that position shows that you know enough to have a PhD. So hopefully we won't see any one of us appearing with that PhD very soon. Um, okay. Uh, uh, you said uh, 6,000 papyrus manuscripts. Uh, yes, nearly 6,000. Yes. Uh, what, what are they? What did you say about them, please? Okay. Papyrus is the earliest substance that the New Testament was written on. Uh, it's a very uh, fragile I, plant. Okay. So, uh, but, uh, I, I, so a I lot of the manuscripts... A lot of the manuscripts are portions of Gospels or portions of, you know, um, the New Testament. Some manuscripts have a lot of fragments, um, and uh, and so we have to read it in partial fragments and figure out where those fragments come from. And there, there is a huge pile of these fragments that were found in in Egypt outside of a they were found outside of a library and they were found in what was the rubbish rubbish pile where they would throw away old manuscripts. You can imagine, you know, when manuscripts were not lasting very long, they would keep making new ones and they would throw the ones that were starting to uh, not be so useful. Like, like a library just gives out old books that they don't want anymore. You know, they get new copies and, uh, and so they threw them all in one pile, and, and then it eventually got covered with sand. It was, it was in Egypt. And, uh, and then later, uh, a couple of uh, explorers who were archaeologists, and, and uh, I think they were students training to be scholars, they discovered this. And, uh, and a, so we've got hundreds of, th like hundreds of thousands of fragments and documents that have not yet been cataloged. And those are of all ancient Greek writing, not just the New Testament. And a number of our New Testament manuscripts have been taken from that. So that's not the 6,000. Those have not even been uh, translated. A lot of them have not been translated. A, a lot of it has, a portion of it has been done, but we're gonna keep seeing more manuscripts appearing and more manuscripts appearing, okay? Because they will find them in those boxes and boxes of fragments that they have stored in, uh, places like uh, London and, and other places where they have scriptoriums. So yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the body of evidence yeah, yeah. for yeah. the New Testament that we have keeps growing all the time. And whenever they yeah. find a portion, they find that those are the words that we are yeah. basically the very same words we're using today. So uh, yes. yeah. uh, greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Greetings. So I, I am able to. Uh, I don't. I don't hear anything. That's fine, brother Steve. I think he was uh, talking to somebody else. Okay. So, yes. All right. Sorry, bra brother. He got another call. That's why he had to attend that. <laughs> okay, so, that's what yeah. it was. Good. Yeah. All right. Brother, thank. You so much because uh, what is happening nowadays is uh, you know especially both Andhra and Telangana are infested with uh, yeah. William Brenner group uh, yeah they're, they're using this they're using this Hebrew text exactly uh, yeah. William Brenner and they are flourishing they are growing growing so yeah. and so wide yeah 
Ten. Well, Sat you know, the Ten. home, the, the refutation of this text has already been made. I, I, I gave footnotes so you can even, yes. you can look for the documentation yourself and you can study the refutation. A lot of it is scholarly language, but there's enough of it that could be understood by a common English speaker that you could, exactly. you could dig enough out of it to use it. Just ignore exactly. what you can't understand, you know, if you're not a scholar. Exactly, brother. So, and uh, Mama, just go that side. And also, uh, oh, the other thing is, uh, I a uh, lot of people are reading Dan Brown's book. Oh, and, such, uh, he, yeah, he claims that it's historical and it's so, it's so full of errors. Uh, there have been some good refutations written about it. Do you have any good refutations there that you're giving to people? Do you have any good refutations of Dan Brown's uh, uh, Da Vinci Code? Not very many, brother. Okay. Maybe I'll but dig then, something uh, up for you. Yeah. Yeah. And then I made uh, something then, that I was using. I made something I gave to Indian students some years back, but I'll have to find it. I think I don't have it in my. So, so and then uh, there is another thing that is going on, uh, even among the so called reform circle, if I can say. Uh, yeah. Not saying that um, the Bible is not complete, it's not holistic, it is not, uh, there are issues with it, and uh, so many things, and thank you for reaffirming, uh, reaffirming us so many things, uh, so much of uh, proof yeah. text, but thank you so much for that. Yeah, there are so many people today who, if they belong to a Reformed church, they think that that's what makes them Reformed, you know, uh, when we use the yeah. We're reformed. We're speaking about the uh, the view that the reformers had that the entire church must be reformed by scripture. That yeah. scripture is the word of God. It's authoritative, and yeah. the scripture must transform the church. The, exactly. the the church of their time was not following scripture. They were following the word of the popes. So. Um, they, they said the scripture, the, we have to return to the scripture. We have to be reformed by the scripture. And so the, the creeds and confessions of faith they wrote were simply primarily just statements of scripture that were organized into an, a useful order that would be reasonable and logical to, so that we could see what is the main teaching of the scriptures themselves. Okay, so um, that's what reformed is. It's anything that departs from that is departing from Reformed, basically. You know, they still call themselves Reformed because they're they're members of Reformed churches. They might be Reformed pastors, but they're departing from what essentially Reformed is and means. Okay, so they use the phrase, the church must always keep reforming. But that does not mean that we reform away from the Word of God to be less, uh, less uh, dis disciples of Scripture and more disciples of the world. No, it means that... We have to, as, a, as we keep slipping and becoming more worldly, we have to keep getting back to the scriptures and keep reforming by the scriptures, and the, the scriptures have to keep shaping us. We can't compromise what the scriptures teach. That's what reformed is. We might disagree uh, about the meaning, and then we have to have serious debates and listen to each other and have very good, solid arguments for why the scriptures should be interpreted differently, but uh, ultimately, um, we're going to have to follow scripture. Uh, what does scripture mean? And so um, I think the reformers were, were right on. They were, they were perfectly on track with what God wanted them to do with the scriptures. Um, there might be some things that have become, you know, kind of fixed by tradition, the way that we do some things and uh, the failure of some of our reformed churches to be as, as um, outgoing with the gospel as they were at the time when the reformers started, they were the most evangelical people on the face of the earth. You know, they were the ones sharing the gospel everywhere. Now we've become this 
covenantal people that only are concerned about our, our own youth instead of sharing the gospel everywhere. Both things have to be happening, you know? And that's why I, I really like that some of the Presbyterian churches in India have given themselves names like uh, the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. They want to say we are following the covenantal doctrine of the Presbyterians and the form of government, but we're also going to continue to share the gospel. And that it's very important not to let that fall by the wayside. Okay, I had my spiel. Any other questions? <clears throat> uh, greetings, Pastor Steve. This is Virginia speaking. I've joined this, uh, uh, this for the first time. It was a okay. great insight and I could... Uh, uh, learn a lot and I just uh, one of my cousin my question is one of my cousin has uh, joined the Mormon church oh. uh, uh, and uh, um, does the Mormon church also uh, completely believe in the Trinity as well as uh, taking the original text or do they add up something else because it was very yeah. difficult for a family to convince him to come out of it and yeah, he still Mormons, continues to be. Yeah. yeah, the Mormons were started by a pseudo prophet named Joseph Smith in the 1800s in, uh, in North America. Um, he claimed he claimed that he discovered that an angel named Moroni um, led him to discover some golden tablets that were hidden by the by he said uh, a two or three of the lost tribes of Israel that were lost after the destruction of Samaria in 721 BC, that some of the tribes fled and they fled to the sea and they fled on boats and they came all the way to America and they are the Native Americans that Columbus named Indians. Okay. So, yeah. so the, he, he said they, that they came there and they, had some uh, some history of their uh, past living in America written in Egyptian hieroglyphics, not in Hebrew, <laughs> not in Greek, which many mm. of the Jews would have, no, they wouldn't have spoken Greek at that time. They would have spoken yeah. uh, Hebrew. Well, let me see, when did the uh, Greeks uh, overcome? Yeah, no, the, the Greeks were at a later time. So they might have spoken Persian and uh, Aramaic, um, you know, which they learned in Babylon. It was kind of a, a Babylonian version of Hebrew that they spoke. And, um, and so um, th this, this is supposed to be the history of them, you know, on these golden tablets. And um, Joseph Smith was given a, spare, a pair of special glasses from the angel Moroni so that he could read these golden tablets. And he kept them always hidden. They were so, so holy. He, God only allowed him to show them to a few select people within his followers so that um, uh, they would not be defiled. It's like the Holy of Holies, you know, that couldn't be seen by the people. And so that allowed him to deceive everyone together with those few select followers that were working with him to deceive all the people, you know. Um, and the Jews would never have written anything in hieroglyphics to begin with. They were far removed from that, you know, centuries later after coming out of Egypt, they didn't keep speaking uh, uh, Egyptian. And, uh, and then uh, he couldn't, he would not have needed a pair of glasses to read it. And, you know, at Pentecost, they were given the gift to speak in tongues, and that is to be able to speak in languages and preach the gospel in a language they never learned, in the various languages that they never learned. So, you know, um, if this man was really a prophet of God after Pentecost, and he's a real prophet, you know, maybe he should have been able to just read those tablets right out, but he couldn't. So then from those tablets, he wrote the Book of Mormon, okay? And he wrote some yeah. other books that were used by the Mormons. The Mormons were persecuted by the North American people, 
and they kept fleeing farther and farther west and they settled finally in Salt Lake City. Joseph Smith was finally uh, killed uh, by someone before they settled in Salt Lake City, Utah. So Salt Lake City is, you know, the, their center. They are one of the fastest growing um, uh, non-Christian, Christian cults in the world. I say non-Christian because a cult is an organization that claims to be the church, but they have added many other writings to the writings of the apostles which they claim to be inspired writings, okay? They basically yeah. don't really follow the New Testament. They only, they only use it to introduce themselves, you know, uh, when they come and visit at your door to, to get Christians to believe that they also are Christians, so you'll come and join with them. And then they slowly in, indoctrinate you and teach you about their prophet, Joseph Smith, and they start introducing their writings to you. And they... Um, let me tell you what their basic teaching is, that um, uh, Jesus Christ and Lucifer were brothers. They had, a, they had a struggle over which view is going to become the view that people follow. And, um, and, and basically then Christ became like the, um, Christ became the, one that was followed, but actually they kind of favor Lucifer, and they they um, a lot of their doctrine uh, is kind of like hinting at Lucifer, the brother of Jesus, being the real uh, true one to look to. It, there are a lot of hints in it. Um, they they believe that they are that Jesus became a god of of this world. Uh, he went from manhood to godhood. And that every one of them who becomes a, a Mormon is chosen by God to become a God of their own world. So then that's why they have to, they, are, uh, they practice polygamy, having many wives, because the more children you have uh, with your wives, the more uh, people you'll have to populate your world after you pass from this life to the next. This, the, there, there's a lot of contradictions that don't make sense, like, if all of your sons that are born to you are also going to become gods of their own world, so how are they, how are they going to become the population of your world? And there's a lot of really strange things. Their, their um, uh, uh, temples are not really places of worship. They are places where they teach people their doctrine, and they go through ceremonies in their main temple in Utah. Uh, ceremonies indoctrinating you into the secret rites, the secret ceremonies. Well, these secret ceremonies, um, they were already, um, a lot of their symbolism, a lot of their secret ceremonies, they came from, um, uh, what is the name of that uh, other group that um, uh, it started in America? Um, oh, my age betrays me sometimes. <laughs> I'm, my, um, they were, um, they were uh, symbols that come from the Masons, a secret society. Uh, Masonic Lodge? And, and the Masonic Is Lodge, the Masonic? yeah. Masonic Lodge. Masonic. Almost, all, almost all of the symbols that are found in the secret ceremonies and then also found on the, sometimes on like the temple in uh, Utah, uh, all of these symbols come from the Masons because Joseph Smith went through the Masons first and he went up very high, very quickly to become a higher and higher authority in the Masons. And then when he left that and he started his own religion and he used all those Masonic symbols in the secret ceremonies of the Mormons. So it's very interesting. And uh, they've worked very hard to try to create uh, anthropological, I mean, archaeological history, because, you know, you, you dig in the Middle East, you find all kinds of evidence of the history of the Bible, you know. Um, the, the Bible was doubted to be a true word of God in the 18th century, because people thought all these stories in the Bible didn't really happen. It's all just myth mythological. It's all myth. But then uh, people that didn't believe the Bible started digging in the Middle East and they started finding the ancient cities and ancient peoples and records of the battles with Israel in other cultures, in other cities that fought with Israel. They found the names of the kings of Israel inscribed in other 
places outside of outside of Israel even. And then they began to realize and learn that all of the Bible history is actually real history. You don't find that when you when you do archaeology in America. So they were they have had to work very hard to produce an archaeological history here to support their golden tablets that nobody has ever seen. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's 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 really a uh, uh, it's really a uh, religion of sorcery, you know? And so uh, we don't call it true Christianity. They, uh, but they, follow... they, do, uh, they do have a, a ceremony of this baptism because you were speaking about baptism, yeah. go and baptize as uh, the, baptism. this one. Yes, and right. also what is, their, what is the type of stance these, uh, the other churches like the Catholics or the uh, Mormons, they have on the Trinity. What is, well, let's, uh, yeah, yeah. The do they, Mormons, do they give the importance to the Trinity as a Mormons Trinity? Don't really give him, the Mormons don't give importance to the Trinity because they hmm. look at the father as one God, the son is a different God. You will become a God. Uh, if you are a oh. male, if you are a okay. male, you will become a God. If you keep going through all of their ceremonies, okay, so you would have okay. the honor, ma'am, of be of mm. being wife of a god, okay. Oh. So, mm. um, and then um, also, um, w what uh, what is their baptism? You know, in Utah, in, under a mountain, they have the archives of every living person that they can possibly gather. Gather the records going back from many generations. Uh, they, they do uh, studies of a person's ancestors whenever a person becomes a, a Mormon because that person can be baptized in place of their ancestors to save them. So the baptisms at a Mormon church are done, you, you get baptized many times for many of your ancestors. You know, One of the things oh. we considered in our last week's seminar was that we, in the church we have baptism only one time, because it symbolizes your spiritual rebirth, your death yeah. with Christ, your resurrection with Christ onto new, newness of life. So you're baptized only one time. And then we have Lord's table, Lord's table that occurs many times because even though we are born of God, we, we are still waiting the redemption of our body, Romans 8, verse 23. So we still have yeah. sin in our fleshly mind. We struggle against the, the flesh. And yeah. And so because of that, we still have sin and we have to keep going. We have to keep confessing our sins and seeking forgiveness. And the Lord's table is like the ceremony that where God keeps promising that he will keep forgiving us as long as we keep seeking, our, seeking his mercy, uh, humbling ourselves and confessing our sins and seeking his mercy. He'll keep forgiving us. He loves us. And, and yeah. he wants to be gracious to us. So that's done many times. We don't do a baptism many times because we understand what it represents. They don't really yeah. understand it. Yeah. yeah. There's, a, there's a reference uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, which Joseph Smith used to teach baptism for dead ancestors. You know, it's, a, it's really a reference about the... Um, people that are dying and we baptize them before they die, you know, even though they're going to be dead in just a few hours, they, they ask for baptism, you know, they're baptized for the dead. <laughs> you know, that's what it's about. And it doesn't mean that we baptize ourselves for dead ancestors and we can save people just by having water poured on us or getting into water. It doesn't mean anything like that. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm, I, I find all of this kind of humorous, so yes. I'm, I'm sorry. It's a very serious matter that your, your son is involved in this. No, my cousin, my cousin, oh, cousin, my I'm cousin. Sorry, your cousin. Yeah, cousin. yeah. I grieve yeah. over it with you. It's a very serious matter. It's a yeah. heartbreaking matter. And it's something uh, that only, only prayer over time, God answering prayer is going to break that. You know, maybe getting together with others and just fasting and praying uh, and just keep praying and just keep praying that God is going to break the bonds of those spirits and set him free so that he can once again learn the truth, you know? Yeah. 